Number 9. Aircraft Graveyard After World War II ended, the U.S. military no longer had any use for most of the equipment it had used in the fight against the Axis powers. Consequently, the machinery was often just left to rot in vehicle graveyards, many of which still exist today. A young urban exploration photographer named Johnny Jew recently explored one of these sites in Ohio, where he found the sad, rusting remains of fighter jets and other aircraft that look plain old pitiful compared to the proud appearance they once carried during their glory days. He captured photos of the deserted plane sitting in the snow surrounded by trees and scrap metal. Jew later reported that he was driving around in search of derelict buildings to photograph when he noticed a large, open space on the map that he was looking at. He decided to check the area out and found the plane graveyard. Someone was at the property, and instead of kicking the young man out, they offered him some history on its contents and let him snap some pictures. Unlike other sites that are filled with decaying World War II equipment, the plane graveyard that Jew stumbled across was created by a private owner. In the 1940s, a scrapyard worker named Walter Zaplata began buying decommissioned military aircraft and reassembling them in his backyard. The collection of around 30 rebuilt vehicles includes a deteriorating F-86D fighter plane, a U.S. Air Force B-25 plane, and an old Boeing 727. Saplata left the site to his family when he passed away in 2010, and they've worked to keep it a secret to prevent thieves from stealing and scrapping parts from the historic pieces. Number 8. Kiska Submarine There's a whale-shaped midget submarine that sits on the shore of a remote Alaskan island called Kiska. When the Japanese Navy occupied the island in 1942, they brought six of these cartoon-like vehicles with them. Only one survives today, and it's rapidly decaying from years of being battered by the elements. It sits on the grass off Kiska Harbor as a lonely, rusting reminder of one of the darkest chapters in world history. The 78-foot-long, battery-powered submarine had a tiny interior with just enough room for two people. Speaking with the Anchorage Daily News, archaeologist Deborah Corbett said that she couldn't imagine a worse job than having to operate one of these claustrophobic vehicles. Midget submarines like this could only dive about 100 feet below the water's surface, and their range was limited to about 90 miles. They also couldn't be charged at sea, leaving ship crews tasked with recovering them. The Kiska submarine was not a suicide vehicle, but it didn't have a high survivability rate, according to researcher Richard Galloway. As many as 7,200 Japanese soldiers were stationed at Kiska, where they remained for 14 months. The American and Canadian militaries reclaimed the island in August 1943 as part of a joint mission codenamed Operation Cottage. They expected the Japanese to resist and were surprised to find that the enemy had fled before Allied forces even arrived. The submarine is one of the only remaining signs of the former Japanese presence, and it will eventually rust away completely. Number 7. The USS Sperry Named for American inventor and entrepreneur Elmer Sperry, the USS Sperry was a type of ship called a submarine tender. Its job was to supply and support submarines. Built for the U.S. Navy in 1941, she was launched just 10 days after Japan's infamous attack on Pearl Harbor. The Sperry spent several months in Australia, where she refitted seven submarines. In 1943, the vessel spent four months in Pearl Harbor. From there, she headed to Midway Atoll in the South Pacific, where she saw the busiest period of her career, servicing more than 70 submarines over a five-month period. The vessel spent the remainder of the war traveling back and forth between the Marshall Islands, the Marianas Islands, Pearl Harbor, and other parts of the U.S. After the war ended, the Sperry ended up at the Long Beach Naval Shipyard outside Los Angeles. In 1961, she underwent a modernization program. For the next two decades, the ship serviced submarines out of San Diego. She was finally decommissioned in 1982 and spent years rotting away among a collection of derelict submarines at the Puget Sound Naval Shipyard in Washington State. The ship was sold to a private buyer in 2011 for over $1.5 million with plans to be dismantled. By then, the Sperry had been relocated to Suisun Bay outside San Francisco, where it sat among a fleet of rusting and rotting military ships. She was finally scrapped later that year. Number 6. Monsell Forts a series of armed towers known as the Monsell Forts punctuate Great Britain's Thames Estuary. Built in 1942, these strange-looking structures were used by the British Army and Royal Navy for anti-aircraft defense and to deter and report German air raids. Each Navy fort had seven floors and housed 120 soldiers. They were built offshore and were then sunk into place at their current sites. 
There were also several clusters of army forts, which were interconnected by walkways. They were designed to look futuristic and were slightly different, but equally as bizarre as the Navy structures. The Monsell forts were decommissioned and abandoned during the 1950s, just a handful of years after the war ended. Over the following decades, several were taken over and used as the headquarters of various pirate radio stations. Many of the Monsell forts still stand today, but only some of them are even remotely usable. Their future remains uncertain as they fall further and further into disrepair. One of the surviving structures functions as the so-called Principality of Sealand, a self-proclaimed independent state that declared sovereignty in 1967. It was founded by a former British Army major named Paddy Roy Bates, who had served in World War II. The British government doesn't recognize Sealand as a legitimate country. In fact, no country does. But the people who live there don't seem to be doing any harm, so the government more or less just leaves them alone. While the rest of the world may find the entire concept of Sealand amusing, its inhabitants take it very seriously. The Principality of Sealand has an official Facebook page and even boasts a royal family. Its current princess, Charlie Bates, has held her position since 2013, just a few years before the former princess, Joan Bates, presumably Charlie's grandmother or great-grandmother, passed away. What do you think of Sealand? Let us know in the comments below and don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already. Number 5. Imari Kawanami Shipyard Built in 1851 on the Japanese island of Kyushu, the Imari Kawanami Shipyard's history predates World War II by nearly a century. During the conflict, it functioned as a munitions and boat factory, employing 2,500 workers at its peak. This is where the Japanese manufactured the notorious Kaiten, or human torpedoes, that its navy used for carrying out suicide missions against the Allies toward the end of the war. The Japanese military had started to consider this extreme last-ditch option in 1943 as the war began turning in favor of the Allies. Several suicide vehicles were developed in a seemingly desperate attempt to help the Axis powers gain an upper hand. Most of the Kai-10 that the military developed were thankfully never used. The ones that did enter service caused more deaths to the Japanese than they did to their enemies. The shipyard continued building and repairing ships until 1953. In 2011, it was demolished and repurposed as a public park. Number 4. Flak Towers After the British Royal Air Force attacked Berlin in 1940, Adolf Hitler ordered the construction of large anti-aircraft towers in several major cities, including Berlin, Hamburg, and Vienna. Known as Flak Towers, these massive concrete structures defended against Allied attacks and doubled as air raid shelters. They had a holding capacity of up to 10,000 civilians and even had room for a hospital ward. Hitler wasted no time building the Flak Towers. He rushed the supplies in by train and they were completed in just six months. Each property consisted of a large tower for gun mounds and a smaller tower which functioned as a control and command center. With walls up to 11 feet thick, the Flak Towers were incredibly resistant to attacks. Their guns were capable of firing up to 8,000 rounds per minute, although their firepower was limited. Only one type of the guns housed within the structures was capable of defending against heavy U.S. and British Air Force bombers. As the war drew to a close and the Red Army encroached on Berlin in 1945, the Nazis used the Flak Towers as some of their last holdouts. But they couldn't stay there forever, and they eventually ran out of supplies and surrendered. Most of the smaller towers were demolished or buried after the war, but the Soviets had struggled to destroy the large towers during the war and deemed it infeasible to tear them down. Some of the flak towers that are still standing have been repurposed. A tower in Vienna is home to an aquarium and a climbing wall, and another in Germany houses several nightclubs and other businesses. Number 3. Battery 223 Off the Cape May, New Jersey coast, there's a drab concrete structure that seems rather out of place against the scenic backdrop of the Atlantic Ocean. The locals all know about it, but it tends to take many visitors by surprise. Known as Battery 223, the building functioned as a harbor defense battery during World War II for the U.S. Army's Fort Miles installation. It's just one of numerous fortifications along America's east and west coasts that were built in 1943 as part of a military modernization program. With 6-inch thick reinforced concrete walls and a blast-proof roof, Battery 223 was built to withstand direct hits from battleships and aircrafts. The structure was hidden using sand and earth and was equipped with 6-inch guns that had a 9-mile range, which were fortunately never fired against an enemy. Battery 223 was decommissioned in 1944 as the war turned in favor of the Allies and as advancing technology rendered the fort obsolete. The Navy used it for radio communications for a brief period after 1958. In 1962, it became part of Cape May Point State Park. The site looks much different now than it did nearly 80 years ago. 
When the battery was built, it sat roughly 900 feet from the shoreline. Today, it sits right up against the water, and it's also no longer covered in dirt, although plants still grow on the roof. Number 2. HMS Urge the British U-class submarine HMS Urge was launched in 1940 and spent the majority of her career sinking German ships in the Mediterranean. Two years later, it left Malta for Alexandria, Egypt, but never reached its destination. Until recently, nobody knew for sure what happened to it, although all signs pointed toward the sub having been sunk by the Nazis. These suspicions were confirmed in 2019 when the wreck was discovered off the Maltese coast. It had been struck by a mine and came to a rest 400 feet below the waves. Experts from the University of Malta have spent the past 20 years mapping the seafloor in the region, but as of two years ago, they hadn't yet located the urge. Francis Dickinson, whose grandfather was the submarine's commander, reached out to the team in hopes that they could find the wreck. And they did with the help of an underwater vehicle and sonar. The British Ministry of Defense announced the news after confirming the submerged vessel's identity as the urge. Before it was found, there was widespread scrutiny about where the submarine had ended up and how it got wherever it was. In 2015, Belgian historian Jean-Pierre Misson claimed to have found the wreck off the Libyan coast far from its planned course. But experts ran into bureaucratic red tape and were unable to look into the matter firsthand, which turned out to be a time and money-saving blessing in disguise, since we now know that Misson's suspicions that he'd found the urge were incorrect. Number 1. Weingut I during the latter years of World War II, the Third Reich tried to build a network of underground bunkers and factories that could withstand Allied bombing campaigns. They implemented one such facility, codenamed Weingut I, in the remote wilderness outside Munich in southeastern Germany. It was planned as a nine-story factory for building jet engines that would be hidden from view with soil and plants. But the Allies had already seized control of German airspace by the time construction began, making it nearly impossible to build the massive facility unnoticed. The Nazis were losing the war, and it quickly became clear that Weingut Eins would never be built on time to advance their agenda in any meaningful way. But the Germans proceeded with the project anyway, working hastily in an attempt to meet their self-imposed six-month deadline. More than 8,500 of the 10,000 workers who built the site were forced laborers. Over 3,000 of them were cruelly worked to death, died from starvation, or otherwise perished from the brutal treatment they suffered at the hands of the Nazis. Keeping the massive structure a secret from the U.S. military ultimately proved impossible. American forces captured aerial images of it, but chose not to bomb the site, perhaps because they knew that there was a forced labor camp nearby. They may have also refrained from attacking Weingut Eins because they knew that there was no way it would be finished by the end of the war. Maybe it even distracted the Nazis in a way that benefited the Americans. Only seven of the 12 planned bunker sections were built before the U.S. Army took over the site in 1945. Two years later, they demolished all but one section, which still stands alone in the wilderness today. Number 9. Russian Helicopter Graveyard Built in 1938 outside the Russian city of St. Petersburg, Goryelova originally functioned as a Soviet Air Force base that housed military aircraft and parts. It was home to several different regiments, as well as an aircraft repair facility. The military stopped using the site after the Soviet Union fell. Nowadays, it serves as an aircraft repair center and an airfield for small planes, as well as the headquarters of a local flight school. Signs of the property's military past are evident in a fenced-off part of the runway, which contains a helicopter graveyard. The decommissioned choppers began accumulating there during the 90s and have decayed from neglect along with several administrative buildings that are no longer used. There are also two abandoned radio towers and a weather station. While nobody has bothered to maintain the deserted vehicles or structures, the owners apparently care enough to station guards at the site to deter trespassers who might want to snoop around or collect scrap metal. It's likely that the helicopters are being kept for their parts by the repair shop, despite their sad state. Number 8 the Devil Slide Bunker Off Highway 1 in San Mateo County, California, there's an odd cement structure that appears as if it's balancing precariously atop a mountain known as the Devil Slide. The graffiti-covered building is a sight for sore eyes, and it looks as if it could fall into the sea below at any moment. 
built during World War II. It's an abandoned military bunker that once functioned as a triangulation station and an observation post. It was one of the six structures that were built along the coastline to protect San Francisco Harbor from an attack by the Japanese. Before the advent of radar, military staff watched out for threats the old-fashioned way from a place with an advantageous view with the help of binoculars. The bunker was abandoned after the war ended. It has since fallen into ruin. During the 70s, the earth surrounding it was excavated for a planned construction project that never went through, which is why the structure looks so awkwardly positioned. A private owner bought it in 1983 only to let it further decay. While it seems like there are no photos of the interior available anywhere online, it's quite clear that numerous trespassers have left their mark on the outside. Number 7. Saint Nazaire Submarine Base during World War II, the Nazis built five large fortified submarine stations called U-boat stations along the Atlantic Front. One of them was located in the seaside commune of Saint-Nazaire in German-occupied France. Saint-Nazaire was one of the largest Atlantic harbors in France, making it desirable to the Nazis. They invaded in 1940 and immediately began using the site for submarine operations. Built over a 16-month span between 1941 and 1942, the U-boat pen at St. Nazaire was designed to withstand British air raid bombs. It was constructed using 17 million cubic feet at a roof that was 31 feet thick in some places. Measuring 980 feet long and 59 feet high, the colossal structure had room for even the largest German battleships. In addition to storing and repairing ships and submarines, the facility had 62 workshops, 150 offices, 92 dormitories, 4 kitchens, 2 electrical plants, a restaurant, and a hospital. It housed hundreds of people at any given time. The British Navy launched an amphibious attack on the base on March 28, 1942. In a mission codenamed Operation Chariot, they blew up the dry dock and it remained out of commission for the rest of the war. And the British won, but their victory came at the immense cost of hundreds of men dying and being taken prisoner. The site sat abandoned for a number of years before it was reopened to the public. Today, it's home to a few museums, a nightclub, a cafe, an art exhibit, and more. Number 6. Asmara Tank Graveyard The Eritrean War for Independence is one of Africa's longest conflicts in recent history, lasting from 1961 to 1991. After 30 years of fighting, Eritrea secured its independence from Ethiopia. It was perhaps an unlikely victory. The Ethiopian military had support from the Soviet Union, while Eritrean soldiers defended themselves wearing sandals made from tire rubber and using weapons captured from the enemy. But the Eritreans were determined to win their sovereignty despite their disadvantages, and they refused to give up without a fight, destroying a lot of the Ethiopians' military equipment in the process. Fearful that seeing evidence of their successes would boost the Eritreans' morale, the Ethiopians stashed the damaged machinery at a site outside the capital of Asmara, where it was hidden from view. It still sits on the city's outskirts today, where it's amassed into a rusting graveyard of broken tanks and other vehicles. While the site is open to the public, very few international visitors gain access to it. Eritrea is second only to North Korea when it comes to the difficulty of getting a visa, and tourists are required to get an additional permit to visit the tank graveyard. Number 5. Fort Ord Fort Ord was officially designated as a U.S. Army base in 1940, although its military use dates back to the First World War. Soldiers were happy to be stationed at the sprawling 28,000-acre property, which sits along California's Monterey Bay. After all, what's not to like? It was near the beach and in a place that's known for its beautiful warm weather. The site grew to include 42 buildings, including barracks, administrative structures, a sewage treatment plant, and more. In the late 1980s, it became clear that human activity had taken its toll on the area. Fort Ord was heavily polluted with civilian and commercial waste. 
along with underground tanks that were leaking petroleum into the soil. It's no surprise then that the property was slated for closure the following year as part of the government's efforts to downsize the country's military installations. The base officially closed in 1994. Extensive cleanup efforts ensued, and in 2012, former President Barack Obama designated Fort Ord as a national monument. It's home to several golf courses that were once only open to military members but are now open to the public, as well as California State University, Montre Bay, and several housing developments for its students and their families. The Veterans Transition Center, which helps homeless veterans get back on their feet is located on the property. There are over 83 miles of recreational trails in and around the Fort Ord National Monument, as well as a former veterinary hospital for war horses, which was added to the National Register of Historic Places in 2014. Around 20% of the original buildings still stand. It's clear, based on their shattered windows, peeling lead paint, and plant overgrowth, that they've been left at the mercy of the elements. There are plans in order to strip most of the structures of their toxic materials and dismantle them. But for now, they remain, serving as a crumbling reminder of Fort Ord's glory days. Number 4. Chanute Air Force Base the Chanute Air Force Base in Rantoul, Illinois, functioned as a technical training center. It opened at the tail end of World War I after the U.S. government appropriated money to build up the Army Air Service. When the war ended, the military faced drastic cuts. Because Chanute was built in a hurry, it had already begun falling into disrepair by 1920 and was in line to be decommissioned. But the government ultimately decided against closing the base, and it was expanded over the following years. During the late 1930s, two massive hangars were built, along with housing for 15,000 recruits. The Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor in 1941 spurred an influx of eager military enrollees along with a housing shortage at Chanute. At its peak, it was home to 25,000 recruits, many of whom had to stay in tents. The famed all-black fighter squadron known as the Tuskegee Airmen trained there. Toward the end of the Cold War, the U.S. government downsized the military. After operating for 75 years, Chanute was finally slated for closure. It was the country's third oldest active base when it finally shuttered its doors in 1993. Parts of the property have been redeveloped as motels, retirement communities, restaurants, a fitness center, data center, and a few light manufacturing facilities. Much of the facility remains abandoned because it's contaminated. Cleanup efforts are ongoing, and some buildings have been demolished. Photographer Walter Arnold snuck onto the base, which has been designated as an EPA Superfund site. He told Atlas Obscura that he was shocked by how deteriorated it was and said that it looked like it had been abandoned for 50 years. It was covered in graffiti, mold, asbestos, and littered with ceiling tiles and other debris. Old curtains, furniture, telephones, a vintage arcade game, and other objects are scattered throughout the buildings. Sadly, the closure of Chanute devastated the local economy, according to Arnold. Half the population left and home values plummeted, and the area is reportedly still recovering today. Number 3. The Maginot Line during the 1930s, France built a series of concrete structures along its borders with Italy, Switzerland, Luxembourg, and Belgium. Known as the Maginot Line, the 280-mile-long string of fortifications was meant to prevent a German invasion by forcing the Nazis to go around the structures through the seemingly impenetrable Ardennes Forest. The Maginot Line was extremely well-built, but it was nevertheless a huge failure. Its designers had relied mainly on their knowledge of past wars and had failed to consider the potential of up-and-coming technology. When the time came for Hitler's forces to get past the line, they simply barreled through the woods using tanks. They surrounded the French and their British allies, pushing them back toward the coast, and took 500,000 prisoners of war as they successfully captured the Maginot Line. 
The French reoccupied the structures after the war but ultimately abandoned them in 1966. Parts of the Maginot Line were auctioned off, while others were simply left to deteriorate. The military continued to use one section into the 1990s, but cleared out completely after the Soviet Union fell. Today, some of the structures are used as wine cellars, a mushroom farm, and a disco. Number 2. Bluey East 2 in 1941, the American military established an Army Air Force base on the island of Ikatek in eastern Greenland. It was built under an agreement that the U.S. made with Denmark to protect the island, which came with an urgent need for airfields. Known as Bluey East II, it was just one of 30 American World War II and Cold War era bases throughout Greenland. They've all been abandoned, and it would be an understatement to say that the U.S. left behind a lot of messes. Bluey East 2 shut down in 1947 after operating for just five years. It's littered with asbestos-ridden buildings, rusting trucks, and other vehicles, and as many as 200,000 corroding aviation fuel barrels, many of which are still full. There are also rumors of hundreds of cases of unexploded dynamite stashed at the site. Because Greenland didn't gain any of its own decision-making power until 1979, it had no say in the American military presence in previous years. Its citizens, who survived mainly on hunting and fishing, were left disgusted and concerned by the deserted junk, which raises obvious environmental concerns. American photographer Ken Bauer petitioned the American government to clean up the site after he visited in 2014. It received over 36,000 signatures, which is less than the minimum of 100,000 that's required for a petition to reach the White House. Anyway, a clause in the original agreement with Denmark exempted the U.S. from any responsibility in the cleanup. In 2017, the Danish government agreed to pay Greenland $23 million over to clean Bluey East 2. The project began in 2019, but it'll take years to complete, especially because the work can only be done during the summer months. Number 1. Plokstina Missile Base as the Cold War heated up during the late 1950s, the U.S. began building underground missile bases. Naturally, the Soviet Union followed suit, building one of its first underground bases in Lithuania in 1960. Located in a remote forest near the village of Plokshyai, the Plokstina base housed medium-range missiles. Construction costs ran into the equivalent of billions of dollars in today's currency. It's around the same cost as building a small town or city, and a small city's worth of around 10,000 soldiers moved into the area to complete the project, which was kept tightly under wraps from the local population. But the Soviet military couldn't hide the Plokstina base from U.S. intelligence, which discovered it in 1978. It was later revealed that the site consisted of four deep shafts, including an underground missile silo. The structures were covered by concrete domes that moved on rails and could be opened in a half hour's time. A team of 300 military members ran the base, which was surrounded by an electric fence. Thankfully, no missiles were ever launched from the property. The base was shut down just 12 years after it began its operation, and it was abandoned for good when the Soviet Union collapsed. Soon enough, it became a popular attraction among urban explorers and thieves looking for scrap metal. One of the four silos was opened to visitors as a Cold War museum in 2012 after undergoing extensive renovation. Number 9 Nuclear Deterrent for Submarines Even though the Cold War ended in the early 90s, the competition between the US and Russia for military superiority is still going strong. Consequently, both nations have designed and built some of the world's most formidable machines and weapons. But the Russian Navy has some catching up to do when it comes to its Soviet-era submarine fleet. It's currently working to replace the outdated fleet with a collection of nuclear-powered submarines, which will be part of its nuclear deterrent force. 
Plans for some of the vessels, known as Bore-class submarines, were in the works before the Soviet Union fell. Design work started in the mid-1980s, and construction on the first vehicle began in 1996. The nuclear deterrent force also consists of four newly developed Khabarovsk-class submarines. Each Kabarov sub will carry six nuclear-powered drone torpedoes that are capable of hitting coastal targets an ocean away. Yikes! These bombs are capable of inflicting ten times the damage as the bombs the US dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, which effectively ended World War II. Double yikes! Three Russian submarines, each carrying 200 nuclear weapons, were recently seen surfacing through Arctic ice several meters thick. This was taken as a display of the country's abilities to navigate accurately beneath the ice and to respond quickly to a nuclear attack. It was also a demonstration of Russia's ability to hide from NATO's anti-submarine forces if tensions reach a boiling point and erupt into war. This is just one of several scary ways the country could launch a nuclear attack or counterattack. Much like the US, Russia is capable of firing ballistic missiles from land, air, and sea, giving both nations plenty of options when it comes to the decision to cause massive, needless destruction. Number 8. Spy Rock Robot Late last year, Russia's defense ministry announced that it had developed a robotic surveillance device that looks like a rock. A video uploaded to social media showed the machine, which was roughly the size of a small pet, traversing the grass on wheels with a mini camera mounted on it. The spy rock can be operated from up to 1.2 miles away and has a battery life of 15 hours. It's motion activated and starts recording audio and video when something triggers its sensor. The information it gathers is then transferred to army headquarters. Perhaps the Russians got the idea from an incident that happened back in 2006 when state television called Britain out for hiding a surveillance device inside a plastic rock and then leaving it on a Moscow street. The discovery led to the closure of numerous non-governmental organizations which Putin accused foreign intelligence agencies of using as a conduit for interfering with Russia's internal affairs. Regardless of where the idea for the cleverly camouflaged spy rock came from, it could come in handy for exploring enemy territory unnoticed. Number 7. Nuclear Weapons The US and Russia are the world's two biggest nuclear powers, meaning they hold the greatest amount of the deadliest weapons ever built. During the Cold War arms race, these two nations amassed some 64,000 nuclear warheads. Since then, that number has reduced dramatically thanks to the Non-Proliferation Treaty, which is an agreement among numerous nations to keep the worldwide nuclear weapons count at 10,000 or less. But both Russia and the US, along with a few other countries, have enough of these weapons stockpiled to completely wipe out an enemy state. The good news is that nuclear warfare is unlikely. In fact, nuclear bombs have only been used twice in war, when the US bombed the Japanese cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki at the end of World War II. Truthfully, nobody would benefit from putting one of these catastrophic weapons to use. If Russia bombed the US, America would certainly retaliate to a similar or greater effect. It's also possible that any other countries involved in the conflict, including allies on either side, would follow suit and resort to using their nuclear weapons. It would cause chaos across the globe. The world's nuclear powers include the United Kingdom, China, and France, and all three of those nations would be likely to take sides in a war between Russia and the US. There would undoubtedly be mass civilian casualties and widespread destruction. Dropping a nuke would be costly in terms of both human lives and economics. It would also strain international relations and come with other unwanted and far-reaching consequences, especially for whichever country acted first. Cleanup and rebuilding efforts would also be extremely expensive. This concept, known as mutually assured destruction, is largely what has kept either of these superpowers from waging nuclear warfare against the other. While it doesn't guarantee that either country will refrain from using its nukes, it makes the possibility far less likely. Hey, real quick, 
If you're new to the channel, welcome. If you're liking this video, be sure to hit the thumbs up and subscribe buttons if you haven't already. Number 6. Military Spy Satellites Modern warfare looks very different than it did in the past. With how far technology has come, countries who could afford it are able to launch spy satellites into space, making it easier than ever to keep an eye on their enemies. Two years ago, news headlines reported that a pair of strange Russian spacecrafts were tailing an American-made military spy satellite hundreds of miles above the Earth's surface. To many, this symbolized a growing threat when it comes to the competition between Russia and the US for superiority in the space-based espionage department. The abilities that come along with such advanced devices would have seemed shockingly futuristic to the world's militaries even just a century ago, when wars were fought, well, the old-fashioned way, up close and personal. Speaking with Time magazine, U.S. Space Force Commander General John J. Raymond explained that the Russian spacecraft had entered into orbit just a few months earlier. It then began maneuvering toward the American satellite, coming within an uncomfortably close distance of less than 100 miles at times. Raymond described the movement as unusual and disturbing, with the potential to create a dangerous situation in space. The U.S. government reportedly expressed concern to Moscow over this, but even if diplomats over in Russia were open to discussing the matter at one point in time, it's probably safe to say that they're unwilling to negotiate right now, given their leader's blatant refusal to scale back on his invasion of Ukraine. Plain and simple, Putin knows that the world is watching and he frankly doesn't care. Number 5. Autonomous Strike Drone In 2019, the Russian Ministry of Defense announced the successful flight of its first unmanned aerial combat vehicle. The Suhoi S-70 Ohotnik B, nicknamed the Hunter, the autonomous drone is designed to deliver precision-guided bombs at long ranges without a pilot. It somewhat resembles the US-made B-2 stealth bomber. The Hunter was first spotted three years ago during ground trials at the Chkalov aviation plant outside Novosibirsk. Vladimir Putin visited the facility in late 2019 and announced that the aircraft's development was moving along according to schedule. Without the need for a cockpit and equipment to perform life-sustaining functions for a human pilot, the Ohotnik has more room for weapons. The technology it uses has been around for a while. It is nothing new to the US and several other militaries of the Western world, but the drone marks a milestone in the advancement of Russian military technology and the country's ability to attack heavily defended targets. The second Ahotnik prototype was rolled out late last year. Preparations for its debut flight are currently underway, according to state news agency TASS. Russian Defense Minister Sergei Shoigu said that the work on the Ahotnik will hopefully be finished by the end of the year. Deliveries of the drone to the country's troops are slated to begin in 2024. Number 4. Hypersonic Missiles Hypersonic weapons travel at speeds of at least Mach 5 or 5 times the speed of sound. It's no secret that the US is actively experimenting with hypersonic technology, and Russia claims to be doing the same. In 2013, the US military completed its first successful test flight of the Boeing X-51A Wave Rider, an experimental hypersonic aircraft that has reached speeds of almost 4,000 miles per hour. The X-51A isn't weaponized. It was meant as a stepping stone to future hypersonic development. Russia, on the other hand, claims to be further along in the process of creating these high-speed missiles. Late last year, Defense Minister Sergei Shoigu announced the successful trials of the 3M-22 Zircon hypersonic missile, which flies at a similar speed as the Wave Rider. It runs on an advanced type of fuel, giving it a 621-mile range. The Zircon flies so fast that it can evade traditional radar systems, which means that it could potentially strike its target with little to no warning. Popular mechanics reported that if a US ship detected a Zircon missile from 100 miles, it would only have a minute to respond. It would be incredibly difficult to intercept the weapon, which is especially concerning since it would only take a few Zircon missiles to sink the most advanced American aircraft carrier. This means that the US not only needs to catch up with Russia when it comes to hypersonic weapons, it also needs to develop a better way to combat them. Number 3. 
Unmanned Submarine Hunters In recent years, several countries have made it a priority to develop quieter submarines that can travel close to shore undetected. To keep up with this advancing technology, DARPA launched the Anti-Submarine Warfare Continuous Trail Unmanned Vessel or ACTUVE program. The vision is to create an autonomous aquatic drone that's capable of traversing thousands of miles of open sea for months at a time, without a single crew member aboard. Nicknamed the Sea Monster, its purpose is to hunt submarines while navigating through narrow channels and shipping traffic using sonar, radar, and other systems that can get the job done without a crew aboard. Open water testing of the new technology began in 2016. DARPA announced the successful completion of the program two years later. The prototype vehicle was then handed over to the Office of Naval Research for further development. DARPA program manager Alexander Whalen praised the transition between agencies as a significant milestone toward the development of unmanned submarine hunters. This type of marine vessel would undoubtedly come in handy to the U.S. military given Russia's recent ambitions to replace its outdated naval submarine fleet with newer and better vehicles that are capable of carrying unimaginably destructive quantities of nuclear weapons. But if Russia happens to have a similar project to the sea monster up its sleeve, it could put the US at a great disadvantage when it comes to submarine warfare. Number 2. Night Vision Technology In 2019, the Russian military's most sophisticated night vision goggles went on display at an exhibition of the country's Syria Operation artifacts in the state of Duma. Known under the type name GOONV-1, the helmet-mounted goggles reportedly outshine U.S. night vision technology with their operational capabilities. They were created for the crews of attack and military transport helicopters. They're equipped with sophisticated electro-optical converters that only the US and Russia have developed. The updated goggles were designed after a helicopter crashed in Syria in 2016, killing both pilots. They were operating with a previous version of the eyewear that was produced during the 1990s. After the accident, helicopter crews were no longer allowed to use the goggles and were issued new ones. Having the correct night vision technology can help pilots fire with accuracy, navigate complex terrain, and perform complicated takeoffs and landings. In addition to being a safety measure, high-tech safety goggles can be the key to gaining an upper hand during nighttime combat. Knowing that Russia is at least as advanced as the US when it comes to this, it could be a cause for concern regarding which military would prove superior in the dark. Number 1. Sukhoi Su-57 since 2002, Russia has been working to develop a stealth jet fighter called the Suhoi Su-57. The single-seat aircraft was designed as part of the Russian Air Force's PAK-FA fighter program, which aims to achieve air superiority and the ability to effectively carry out attack operations. There are numerous sophisticated features to the Su-57, including super maneuverability, super cruise, and advanced avionics that supersede the previous generation of fighter aircraft. It's the most advanced Russian fighter jet in existence and one of only four operational fifth-generation stealth fighter jets in the world. Late last year, Russia's state-sponsored news agency TASS reported that the Su-57 outperformed its American equivalents, the F-22 and F-35. Military expert Alexei Leonkov told the media outlet that the Su-57 outranks its U.S. counterparts in weapon systems, robotics, radar, and electronic warfare equipment. Meanwhile, Western media has repeatedly claimed that American-made fifth-generation fighter jets are superior to the Su-57. Moscow reportedly plans to start producing an upgraded version of the jet in 2025. The newer model will be equipped with a two-seat modification, allowing a second pilot to control nearby combat drones. It's capable of flying at speeds of up to Mach 2, and at just $25 to $30 million each, it comes at a much cheaper price tag than its American equivalents. When it comes to which country's fighter jets are better, it's one military's word against the other. It's difficult to say with any certainty which aircraft reigns supreme. But one thing is clear, either way, Russia has caught up to the US with its fighter jet technology and is showing no signs of slowing down or stopping the development of faster, stealthier, and all-around better planes. 
And these ultra-modern fighters are going to be available to other countries, which means that if the US and Russia went to war, any of Russia's allies that have their own Su-57s could provide extremely powerful support. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to give it a thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe. Bye for now.